Hey everyone, welcome back to another video. Today we're going to be covering everything to do with mid game. If you guys have been watching my coaching VODs on my second channel, which is linked below, you would see that a lot of the people that I've coached lately do have problems in the mid game. And it's something that I think a lot of you do struggle with. And to be honest, it is just a difficult part of the game to learn. But hopefully after this video, you guys have every, everything you need to know in order to play out the mid game. Uh, so yeah, let's get into it. So the first thing you guys need to know about mid game is that especially in solo queue, it's never going to be perfect. Simply put, there's like a lot of moving parts in the mid game and especially in solo queue when one a lot of the players don't know what they're doing and two that you're not on cons with each other it's really hard to get the perfect mid game scenario so in that kind of sense adaptation is really important and kind of knowing what your goals are and then like figuring out in the game kind of like how to reach those goals so Mid game starts, I'd say when the tier one towers start falling around 15 minutes or when people start to kind of switch around lanes. I think it can start earlier or later than that, but it's not too important. Basically when those tier ones start falling, that's when I'd say mid game really starts. So when you come into the mid game, depending on if you're winning or losing, you kind of need to think like what your goals or what your objectives are. So if you're winning, you want to snowball yourself and your team. Like you want to extend that lead further. So for snowballing yourself, this is stuff like getting as much like gold and XP for yourself as possible. That can take the form of like pushing a lot of waves, like farming a lot of waves by yourself, taking jungle camps, taking towers. There's a lot of ways to snowball yourself. It can even be like catching people in the side wave. Um, it can be like killing people in the jungle. There's a lot of ways to snowball yourself, right? And then for snowballing your team, it's stuff about like getting that side lane priority, like taking control of the enemy jungler, using your, like your side lane priority to create like a numbers advantage or to use your lead to kind of snowball team fights and stuff like that. So again, there are a lot of different ways in the mid game that you can snowball yourself and your team. But if you're already winning, you need to be looking for ways to kind of snowball that or extend that lead further and further. Now, if on the other hand, you enter the mid game behind, it can be a lot more difficult. So in that sort of situation where you don't really feel comfortable pushing out the side lane, either because you can't win 1v1 or just like you're not strong enough really to make any headway on the side lane, your goal instead is to stop the bleeding. So basically you want to do the opposite of what uh, teams do when they're winning. You want to slow this down as much as possible. You want to make it really difficult for your enemy to gain any advantage. So the way this kind of looks is just like catching waves under your tower, you know, being really safe not giving over any extra kills like the nature of being behind is that the enemy is in the driver's seat right like you shouldn't get to make proactive plays but you can make reactive plays and more importantly you can make sure that the enemy doesn't just like get a bunch of advantages for free especially in solo queue the enemy team will always make a mistake so a lot of the time in mid game especially if you're behind you're pretty much just waiting for that you're trying to just slow it down as much as possible not create a chaotic game just keep farming at the tower keep catching waves and not really give over any extra gold Finally, when you enter the mid game, you want to think about your champion specific goals. So there'll be some champions that really just want a team fight. There'll be some champions that want to like catch people in the jungle. There'll be some people that really just want to spam push the side wave. Uh, there will be some champions that don't want to go side lane at all, right? So there's a lot of different things uh, and based on the champion, what you can do. And I'll give you some examples. So a champion like LeBlanc uh, has a lot of mobility, has decent wave clear, uh, and has the ability to kind of kill people either on the side lane or in the jungle. So as LeBlanc, you might really want to just like push the side wave as far as you can, knowing you have that mobility to get out, try and pick people either under the tower or in the enemy jungle. Uh, so that could be your kind of like goal as LeBlanc. Now, something that LeBlanc doesn't have is the ability to do camps really fast. So if you take a champion like Lucian or Ryze, they might, instead of like trying to pick people in the jungle, they might just be wanting to push the side wave really far and then farm as many jungle camps as possible. So that's another thing you can do. You might also find that champions say like Zoe or Zareth are really terrible on the side lane and instead want to try and like stay around mid uh, and kind of poke enemies as much as possible around that and we will talk about this a bit more later but there will be times where you can't kind of achieve your champion specific goals because your team is doing something different so you will see sometimes in pro play where a zoe or a zareth might stay mid just farming but if you do this in solo queue and your ad carry isn't willing to just like push the side wave you could end up sharing a bunch of gold and xp and that wouldn't be snowballing yourself and your team because you would just be sharing the gold evenly so you should come into the mid game identify if you're winning or losing and think about kind of like what your champion wants uh, and then look to kind of use that as a framework for helping you make decisions in the mid 
game. Let's take a look at what the ideal mid game scenario looks like. And I will also explain why it's like this. And I think that can kind of help you get a perspective on how to play out the mid game, knowing like kind of what situation you want to create. So generally the way it works is once mid game starts, you have your AD carry and support go mid. You have your top lane go to the side that's opposite of the objective that's going to be next. And you have your mid laner go to the side of the objective that is next. So if for example, Baron is spawning and this is kind of the next objective, you would want to have your mid laner on this side of your map and your top laner on the opposite side of the map. Likewise, if it were instead Dragon that was spawning, you'd want to swap the other way around with your mid laner in close proximity to Dragon. And that basically means that your mid laner is close by to contest. The jungler's role in mid game is a bit more flexible because they still have to farm their camps, but normally the jungler will kind of clear their camps towards the strong side. So in league, there's a concept of strong side and weak side, which is pretty much just um, kind of what side you're playing towards, you know, what side has the vision, which side has more players on it. So if, for example, you're playing towards Baron, you're dropping all your vision up here, everyone's kind of playing around this, then top side would be your strong side. So the way junglers normally play in the mid game, they clear like from the weak side to the strong side. So that means that when they finish, they, they're clear, they're on the top side and ready to pressure the map. So if, for example, top side is your strong side, you're playing for Baron or you're playing for tier one or tier two or something, you'll see the junglers start out, clear their bot side camps and path up and then be able to pressure up here. There are a couple other things that change how your ideal mid game looks. So I'm gonna go through a few examples. The first is what happens if both your mid and top have DP? Well, in that case, they are a bit more interchangeable, but you might kind of decide based on what the champions are. So for example, let's say we're playing for this top side baron and let's say we have like a mid vladimir and like a top lane jace so in that sort of situation we actually might want to change this and the reason is jace is much better at playing strong side towards the objective um than vladimir is you know jace he's not a very good weak sider he's very easily dived uh he can't like clear waves on the tower very easily Whereas Vlad, Vlad is extremely hard to dive. And also Vlad doesn't really have the tools to accelerate kind of the same as Jace. You know, you're not really going to have Vlad like diving towers unless he's really far ahead. Whereas you will definitely have Jace like creating a lot of priority and, and starting to take towers. So in that sort of situation, uh, Jace can create more pressure on the strong side than Vladimir. And Vladimir is also much better on the weak side than Jace. So in that sort of situation, despite them both having TP, you may actually want like your mid laner bot uh, just like AFK farming with TP, like trying not to die on the weak side. And then you have your jungler kind of play towards your strong, strong side Jace and accelerate him further. Another thing that could affect how the ideal mid game looks is actually whether you're ahead or behind. So if you're really, really far behind, it might be impossible to actually contest the objective. And in that case, you might want to choose to trade instead. So let's say, for example, again, uh, let's say the dragon is spawning soon. We, so we have our mid laner down here uh, and our jungler is here as well. If we're really far behind, there's pretty much no point contesting this dragon anyway. It's just going to be a lost fight for us, and it's not really going to amount to much. In that sort of situation, you actually might want to swap your mid laner away from the objective, or whoever kind of uses the gold the best, and then actually just completely trade. So in this sort of situation, let's say the enemy team is doing dragon, your mid and jungle might actually be able to trade a kill or tower or camps on the top side. So even though it's not like an ideal macro situation, I guess, it's more that like you were kind of forced into this situation because you can't match your opponents on the strong side. Final way I want to talk about is actually how like win conditions can affect it. So if, for example, red team here has something like Evelyn jungle and Fiora top even if they want to play to a different objective they're probably just going to lose team fights and stuff anyway like even if they're ahead you know like let's say this team is like 2k gold up this red side team here despite that blue team might have a way stronger team fight comp and they might just want to make it so if the enemy team does start baron that they lose so much on the bot side that it's not worth it so in that sense you do kind of need to think about like playing towards your win conditions as well and what that kind of might change your lane assignments and stuff to look like but it's not super important for you to know. I think you mainly just need to know your own champion's win conditions and not worry too much about like the rest of your team because at that point, it's like you can't micromanage everyone on the map, at least not without like compromising your own ability to play. So I recommend just focusing on yourself. There are a few more things that like can affect the mid game, but I think again, it would be more for like a team level thing. You know, maybe if you're playing like as a five man on comms, you could think about stuff like that. But for solo queue, I think it's relatively unimportant. Feel free to skip this section if you want. I'm gonna explain kind of on a higher level, like why the roles ended up like this, how this kind of happened. Uh, so you might find it interesting, but if you, you know, you're short on time, like feel free to skip it. Uh, so yeah, let me explain kind of why it ended up like this. So the first reason is that the AD and support generally go mid because one, they normally have pretty good control of the mid wave, like two people, if, for example, your mid laner stays here and they have to 2v1, it might be quite hard for your kind of mid laner to get mid prior against the enemy bot lane. Uh, and now that's really important because 
like as you kind of know from the early game like mid game or mid prior is really really important right uh, and another reason is that having your support in the center of the map kind of allows them like the most freedom to impact the rest of the game. Uh, now, so why don't you put your mid laner here? Well, sometimes they do. Sometimes you do put your mid laner here and your ADC on the side lane. Let's say, for example, you have a strong wave clear mid like Xerath or Zoe, and you have a strong side laning any carry like Vayne or something, you might look for those assignments. But generally, the mid laner and the top laner want to be on side waves uh, because they value XP like really, really highly. So they don't want to be sharing gold with the support. So that's kind of how we ended up with the AD and support in, in the mid lane uh, and the mid and top kind of on the side lanes. Now, how, how does this kind of ideal mid game play out? Well, generally what they do is your teams like AD and support gets prio over mid. And what this does, it forces the enemy team to kind of be stuck under their tower showing, and that allows the, uh, the support in particular to walk up and start pressuring the enemy jungle. So if this happens and the support starts moving up, it can be very scary for the enemy mid laner to stay under this tower because he's at threat of being dived uh, and he also might have his vision cleared. So this kind of mid priority allows the support to impact the map in a lot of ways. They can walk down the river, pressure the enemy top, they can walk up, you know, take control of the enemy jungle, force the enemy like off their side wave towers. And generally, uh, if you do have that mid prior, you should see eventually this top tower die because the support just moving here and then coming back mid for every wave makes it really, really difficult for the enemy to stay under their tower. You kind of have the seesaw effect where once the mid laner takes this tower and can push it in, now the mid laner can start coming down and that makes the enemy like jungle AD and support scared in turn. So the mid laner now is stuck under tower and the AD and support have to be quite careful of mid lane coming down and diving them or just in general taking control. Now there are a couple steps to this and because sometimes people skip the steps they can get punished for it. So let me explain how this works. The reason the waves are so important in the mid game is because they can create numbers advantages, they can create gold, XP, and also because they tell you exactly where the enemy team is. So when you're behind, you're really looking for opportunities to catch the enemy when they're skipping steps. So let's say for example, that the support starts walking in uh, without a wave being pushed. So let's say the wave has already died. You don't see the enemy AD and support. You might have your support walk up uh, and be ganked by like three people in the top side jungle here. And that would be really bad, right? Because they basically, they didn't, they didn't skip or they skipped the step uh, and that kind of led to their death. So let's talk about like what these proper steps are. The way, the, the, the best way to kind of gain control in the mid game is first to push a wave, which forces the enemy team to show. So if you push a wave, they should have to show their AD on this mid wave. And now you know exactly where he is and you can walk somewhere with a numbers advantage. Now, if the enemy AD didn't show on this wave, they're just giving up a wave and then you don't go in because they're probably camping here, but they've lost something for it. You know, it's not like they're losing nothing for it. So the first step in the mid game is to make your enemy like laner or opponent or whatever show on a wave. So if you're pushing top, you push this wave all the way in and the enemy mid laner doesn't show, like you need to be kind of thinking about where they are. If they based, obviously you can like hit the tower or something. Uh, but if they didn't, then you kind of need to be pretty pretty scared because you if you walk into the jungle here and you face check their mid laner, there's a very high chance you die. Now, if you're on the kind of back foot of this, if you're on the losing side, you need to be like looking for kind of those mistakes from the enemy team, you need to be catching waves and then trying to look for opportunities like normally in your own jungle when the enemy team is skipping steps, maybe not moving as they should and getting caught out as a result. So kind of TLDR the explanation, basically the lanes ended up like this because it allows each role to kind of gain the maximum gold and XP without like really compromising the other roles. It also gives like your support the greatest freedom on the map and they can use that to help like push the other side lanes in and then there's this kind of seesaw effect where like the mid lane will use their priority to help the side lane get priority the side lane will use their like pressure to like kind of pay it back and eventually you can crack the towers like that so you'll generally see like the mid laner or sorry the mid like the mid section of the map your AD and support normally will use their prior to help break like a tier one once the tier one is broken, you'll see this mid laner move up. They use it prior to come keep threatening mid. Eventually this mid tier one gets broken uh, and then they can either transition their pressure down to also break this tower in the same manner as they did the first one. Or then you might see like if this tower is dead, the AD and support move up. Again, they take deep vision, you know, maybe getting to move like here or here. And then eventually like they use it prior to cause this tower to fall. So yeah, I think that's like kind of how it ended up and sort of an explanation of why the roles ended up in this way. Again, I feel like it's not 
it's not amazingly useful to know it, but it is quite interesting. And I think maybe if you know kind of like on a higher level how that works out, you might also have like a better idea when you watch like VODs, either pro VODs or like solo Q, or like high level solo Q VODs of kind of why it's ended up like that. And also it's one thing I think you should take away is how interlinked it all is. It's very important that you guys realize that every role on the map in the mid game affects just about every other role on the map. And that's really, really important to know because we're going to talk about a bit later some of the rules or some of the guidelines that can help you make decisions in the mid game, kind of like with using that goals as a framework, then adding some extra stuff so you can, that you can think about. So now that you understand the mid game on a more macro level, let me give you some kind of guidelines to help you achieve these things. So the first thing you need to think about, like if you've made your goal, you know, you've decided like what your champion wants, um, whether you're playing like winning or losing, think about these guidelines. So the first thing is what is the most pressuring lane assignment for you? So basically, which lane can you go to to create the biggest or like the largest amount of pressure on the map? So just like when you base, think, okay, if I go top here, like what can I do? If I go bot here, what can I do? And just like think about like where the next objective is. So like where Dragon is and stuff like that, or where Baron, basically what your next objective is gonna be. And like, what's the easiest way for you to pressure that? Because most of your mid laners, you're gonna wanna go to the place that's kind of closest to the next spawning objective, typically Dragon uh, and then Baron later in the game. And that's like a good way to decide. But depending on what champion you're playing, you might find there's actually a more pressuring lane for you to go to. The next thing is, in line with snowballing yourself and your team, it's very, very important that you spend as little time as possible sharing gold and XP. So if, for example, you're ever on a wave, like sharing it with your AD carry, sharing it with your jungler or whoever, generally that's bad. It's like, yeah, it's actually just quite bad. You're losing a lot of gold and XP as a team. And if you are in that situation where, let's say, for example, you are meant to be top or you are meant to be mid and someone's sharing the gold and XP with you, you need to go find somewhere else. Even if it might not be optimal, kind of like, and in a perfect world, you need to just find more gold and XP for yourself. So, you know, let's say you were meant to be the one catching mid. Let's say you're an AD carry action. And you're meant to be the one catching mid. If your mid lane is sharing with you, you just go top. You just have to be a side laner. You never want to be sharing gold and XP in the mid game. It makes you fall very, very far behind. Um, if all three waves are getting farmed or like the wave is too far up and you can't farm it, then you find gold and XP somewhere else. You go and farm camps. You try and like help someone else like dive someone, you know, basically you want to be like hungry all the time for gold and XP. Uh, and if you're not getting any, you need to like try farming find some and if you are getting some you need to try find more third thing is to push the side lane as far as you are able to safely so like if the ideal is that you push the side wave all the way to the enemy tower that ensures a few things one that it will bounce back to you it also ensures that the enemy uh, team is going to lose that wave under the tower so that's the ideal and also it gives you the most time because if you crash the wave all the way under the enemy tower it's going to be a while before the wave bounces all the way back to you you get all that time to roam make picks base farm camps like there's a lot of stuff you can do but it's important to do it safely. And there might be things that you kind of have to consider this. We'll talk about that a bit later. But if, for example, you push up too far and you die, you might kind of undo all that kind of like advantage that you just gained. So you, we're going to talk about this in a second, but you're going to have to like consider a bunch of things and see like how far you can actually push. Oh, thanks for the follow. But yeah, you should basically think like, how far am I able to push given my champ, given my vision, stuff like that. Um, safely without dying essentially the last one is to be grouped one minute before objective fights so before objectives are spawning is basically the only time where it's fine to be grouped as a team and that's because like while you will be sharing a little bit of gold and xp at this point ideally beforehand you've made it so you're not so if, for example you push the top wave all the way into their tier tower tier two tower then you base you should have time to come to dragon and get all that before you have to go back to that top wave but even if like you might lose the top wave for it generally it's just better to be at the objective fight it's very rare in solo queue that your team is willing to just give an objective so most of the time you're just going to have to be there to fight with them and a lot of the rest of the game is just making yourself stronger for these objective fights because they're basically something that happens every game it's very rare that you just don't have objective fights and you can think almost of the rest of the mid game as making those objective fights as good as possible for you so like creating numbers advantages with your side lane pressure you know giving yourself a big golden xp lead getting like a big uh, we're getting like large vision control in like a side of their jungle. Basically all this stuff on the side lane is trying to make these objective fights easier for you. So that means that like, if that's kind of what it's doing, then you, you have to actually be there. So finally, we have some information to help you make decisions. So we have some champion specific decisions. So you need to consider stuff like your mobility, your 1v1 strength and stuff like that. 
if we take a champion like LeBlanc or Akali with a high amount of mobility, good, like really strong 1v1, they will be generally fine in the side lane regardless of if they have vision or not, because it's very hard to catch these champions. On the other hand, if you're a champion like Zoe, somewhat weak side lane 1v1 and also no mobility, you're very, very gankable. So your kind of margin of error, your margin of safety is very, very different. You're going to need more vision and kind of more support from your teammates uh, than those other champs that are a bit better at the side lane. You also need to think about like what the enemy threats are. So you're gonna have a very different experience pushing the side lane versus say an enemy team's Ivern jungle and an enemy team's Nocturne or Evelyn jungle. Side laning against champions like Nocturne and Evelyn is really, really hard. You need to kind of wait for them to have ults down or you need to have like a really good idea of where they are on the map or you need to have their jungle just like lit up like a Christmas tree because otherwise if you push against these champs you're pretty much giving them 300 gold. On the other hand a champion like Ivern especially if you have mobility and you can just dodge his root it's pretty much not a threat to you at all. So you do need to think about like what kind of champs they have if they have something super threatening like Zed Evelyn um, or like Lissandra Nocturne you know these can be extremely scary to split push against and then if they had something that wasn't threatening at all if they had something like Karma Ivern uh, you might not care at all. So you need to kind of factor that in the next thing is that when you are pushing or when you're deciding what to do in the sideline, you need to check your teammates' positions on the map. So you need to think like, okay, where are my teammates? Like, where is my jungler? Where is my bot lane? Like, can I push at the moment? Because oftentimes, if you've watched any of my coaching videos, again, on my second channel, recommend checking that out, um, you will see sometimes like people pushing really far when their team's in base. So if your jungler's like in bot lane and your top lane, or if your jungler and supporter in base, that's a really bad time to push. It's very, very scary. So you need to think about like where your teammates' positions are and how they might affect you on the sideline. Another thing is checking enemy position. So for example, like we were talking about before with the jungler, if you know their entire team is like in the jungle right next to you, it can be very, very scary to push. On the other hand, if you know their entire team is bot side, even if you don't have vision on your side of the map, you just know no one can be there. So then you can just push like a maniac. So you need to think of both your teammates and your enemy's position. Another thing is before pushing, check the vision and objectives. So see how long it is until the next objective spawns. If it's only like a minute away, you probably need to be thinking about basing already and kind of getting down there. And you also need to see just how much vision if, that you have. If you have no vision of their topside jungle and you're playing a champ with no mobility, it can be very hard to push to that like top tier two tower. You might instead just want to push it to the river or like, you know, a bit further, basically as far as you can do it kind of without dying. And it is important that you push your limits a little bit so you kind of get to know like what you can get away with and what you can't. So another thing is to think in terms of gold. So if for example you're going to contest a dragon and your entire team's going to group for that it might actually be better to give the dragon like push mid push top you know take all the enemy top jungle take top tower that could be worth more gold overall. Something you will need to think about is is my team just gonna fight anyway? But a lot of the time, like you can actually trade an objective, especially if you're like a scaling champion and, and go trade it for something else, you know, get a lot more gold on the other side and that can actually put you kind of in a better spot. The last thing to think about is do you actually want fights right now? So if you're playing a scaling champion or a full scaling comp against a full early game comp, you might be completely fine with giving something up and just like trading really hard for it, you know, taking as, as much farm as you can on the top side or just not fighting it. So this is going to be a bit more difficult in solo queue because again, a lot of the time your team will just fight whether it's good or not. Um, but yeah, like you can think about if you actually want team fights, you know, you're a split pushing champ, you might not want team fights at all, or you might be so far behind that you don't really want to be a, a part of team fights anyway, and you instead just want to catch back up. Let's go over two gameplay examples. So first we're going to do a game where we're very, very ahead, where we have all the tools we need to kind of take over the side lane. And then after we're going to go over a game where our only real option is just to play as safe as possible and kind of farm out and try and come back. So that will show kind of the two extremes. And normally games will be somewhere kind of in between those and it's up to you to kind of like figure out kind of like where that game lies and like how aggressive you can play on the side lane. Um, but let's take a look at this one. So if you guys have watched my fully explained uh, Lucian guide, it was or is just not not the not the full in-depth guide, sorry. It was just like a, a solo queue game basically. I already talked about my thought process for this game. Um, so if you do want to check that out, just go to like 15 minutes in the video and we'll start here. But you see the, the, the mid game has just begun basically. So Ezreal is mid, um, I'm now on the side lane. We just took Dragon, which was why I was down here in the first place. So I was on the strong side of the map here. Um, and I have a lot of gold, but I'm pretty safe to just push in. So I know that no one really has threat on me. I win the 1v1. I'm not too scared about their volley bear jungle. So all during this time, I am okay to just push the wave basically as far as I want. I still have my Evelyn on the bot side of the map. Like she hasn't based yet. Um, so I feel very safe at the moment. Also, we just saw him... Uh, it's just saw the Zillion bot. I was thinking about pushing more here, but now 
I have a lot of gold, Evelyn's going back top, and now Volibear's bot. So it was basically like, there's a lot of reasons that meant it was kind of like scary for me to stay around here, so I decided to base instead. Uh, coming back on the map, the next objective is actually going to be this Herald. Dragon's not up for a while, Herald is, and also top tower, top tier 1 could be an objective as well, so I decided to path onto the top side. To accelerate myself a little bit further, I was going to take these Krugs, but then I couldn't because the wave was crashing. So I do kind of want to come get the Krugs later, but I can't quite get them. You can see here, like at this point, I push this wave, right? And then I feel a little bit scared. You can see my Evelyn is bot, um, and my LeBlanc is showing mid, and I don't see where their jungle is at all. So actually, if you just freeze this frame right now, my support is hovering bot, I have very little vision top, and my jungler is ganking bot. So at this point, I have to be quite safe. And the thing I can do like to kind of accelerate, my, accelerate myself the most here is actually to take just this jungle camp and then come back to top. Now that we come back here, we saw the Volibear showed bot, uh, and we can go back to playing really aggressively on this wave. Uh, and now with Evelyn back top, we can be super aggressive again. So there's pretty much nothing to be careful of. Uh, and I just keep pushing these waves all the way in. Again, the reason I'm skipping through this is because I have already talked about this like in the game that I played this. So check out, I think it's just like a 10 0 9, 10, yeah, it was like 10 kills, 0 deaths, 9 assists, Lucian fully explained. So I'd highly recommend checking that out if you want like literally a step by step. But I think I'm kind of doing it at a high enough level here that you can kind of, I don't know, just get the gist. So basically, it was just we were looking at the map, we we're assessing all the threats. Uh, we killed, we killed the Scion. And then we see Volibear bot here again. This is key. So after killing this guy, I would have taken the top tower because we have Evelyn nearby, but I probably wouldn't have pushed any further. But when we see Volibear on this ward right now, now I know that I'm super safe to do whatever I want. So I push really far, I take the top tower, I take the Grom, I take the blue, I come back and shove another wave. So all because this Volibear and Zillion are showing bot and my Evelyn is like somewhat near me, now I can play as aggressively as I want. I can literally do and farm like literally whatever. So I take all the camps, I push a ton of waves, I base with 2.7k gold uh, and I'm 10 CS above the clock in a solo key game. So all this is really, really good. I actually got my base stopped, I remember this kind of annoying um, but yeah so that's kind of like this is more what an ideal side lane should look like you're considering all those things like the teammates and enemies positions and then you're snowballing yourself kind of as much as you are able to kind of like given those circumstances now let's look at a more difficult example this is actually from my stream trish tv shock lol oh, so make sure to follow this. let me mute that really quick so in this sort of situation i'm playing the side lane against akali and evelyn now evelyn's dead at the moment so i have like a, a little bit of time that i can kind of play the game normally like before she gets here but in general i don't win 1v1 in the side lane that's kind of the main point uh, and the game can be quite scary now i do have map cover on um so it's quite hard for you to kind of tell here but like you can see for a moment that my zinzao is actually on the top side uh the enemy evelyn actually like is gonna respawn and then path the bot side so i need to be quite careful pushing out these waves basically it's just really scary for me to push at the moment i don't win the 1v1 uh, my team is on the other side of the map and basically, I'm just going to play like really, really safe. You can see here, I'm actually just thinking about recalling because I'm pretty sure that like on this next wave, like Riven can be here um, or Evelyn could pass here and I'd be quite scared. So I just end up basing. There isn't anything I can pressure here. Uh, I go for the base and then just like walk out bot. Um, I do see Riven on the top side of the map and I see Akali here again. Sorry, it's not the best example, but I was trying to find one that was quite recent. Uh, so in this situation, like now that circumstances have changed, I can actually take the opportunity to quickly push a wave. Also, my support is walking down to me, so I know that I can like path kind of aggressively here. And even if I fight Akali, I'm going to have some backup. So even though I'm kind of... In a, in a situation where I don't really win the side lane and it's quite difficult, there are still kind of windows of opportunity to kind of play for things. So after we kill this guy and we push the wave all the way in, I take a camp and another wave and then I base. Now out of base here, it's again pretty hard for me to contest the side lane. You can see I'm down 40 CS to the clock. Um, Akali Evelyn is still pretty scary for me. So the way I path here instead is rather than walking bot, to this wave that's really far up and quite scary, I actually go top to try and counter something with Gwen. So like I was saying before, ideally you don't like share gold and XP. So if you look at the map, it's kind of better if I'm bot, um, but I don't really have the option of going bot. If I go bot, I can't really pressure anyway. I'm not sure I can get gold and XP. So I'm able to kind of make something that um, people kind of call like, I don't know, there's a few ways people call it just like non-efficient plays or like cheap plays, basically plays that are not optimal, um, 
like in terms of gold and XP and stuff like that, but sort of become optimal because there isn't anything better to do. Now skipping a bit further to this, I go back bot because I have Rel with me. And this is what I mean, like this is not going to happen every game. And like this is Challenger ELO, right? So it's like most often going to happen in my ELO and it's it still doesn't happen all the time, right? It is really nice if you can have your rel kind of shadow you like this, you know, your support, allow you to help you push waves like this. But how often this is, is this going to happen? Like, honestly, in a lot of your games, pretty much never. So that's why you need to be able to adapt because I can say stuff like this and say like, this is the ideal for playing the side lane. But if you don't get this kind of support, like you might not be able to do this. So if I didn't have Rel with me, I would probably clear this wave, but then because I don't have like any further vision, or actually I might, I can't remember if I have vision or not because of the map cover, but if I didn't have vision here, I would just back off. This would be as far as I could push. Um, but because I have Rel with me, I'm able to push a bit further. So I think that's really important, guys, is that when you are behind, you're generally looking to kind of like catch waves um, and like wait for the enemy to make mistakes. But if you do get opportunities to push because of circumstances on the map, then you can take those to be push a bit further. So guys, that is going to be it for this video. Hopefully this covered most of what you need to know for mid game. To be like brutally honest with you guys, mid game is just really, really hard. It's like not something that can really be scienced out. There's a lot of adaptation that has to happen. And even amongst pro players, there's like very big differences in skills in the mid game. If you look like a player like Chovy that just gets the absolute most out of every mid game, like accelerates his farm to kind of unbelievable levels, even at the high level, there is like massive differences in players in this sort of skill. So don't be worried if you can't do it perfectly at all. Like I can't, and I'm, there are not many players that can, perhaps not any players that can. Uh, so yeah, if you have any questions about anything in the video, please let me know, but hopefully it kind of answered the more general questions about the mid game and it gives you some kind of framework to work towards. I don't think it's perfect by any means, but I think it's just going to give you like the ability to go into the mid game with a plan and kind of have some sort of reasoning for the decisions you're making. So anyway, if you liked the video, go ahead and like and subscribe. We'd appreciate it a lot. Sub to my Twitch channel, Twitch TV Shock LOL. I've been streaming a lot over there and yeah, I'll see you guys next time.